Bonjour. Good morning, Alexander. How are you? Good morning. Bonjour, Good morning. Monsieur Jolie. Je vais essayer Bonjour. de vous appeler Hubert, hein, comme vous me l'avez permis lors de notre précédente conversation. Merci beaucoup de vous joindre à nous. Euh, je vais changer maintenant pour l'anglais parce que vous savez que mon français, pas, malheureusement, ce n'est pas si bon comme je voudrais. Uh, so, thank you so much. <laughs> It's an absolute delight and honor. You know, what a great group of people you've assembled and what a great leader you are. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity for hopefully a good dialogue. You know, I think we all share a lot of wisdom on these topics. So we are here to learn from each other. Absolutely. It's a huge pleasure and a true, true privilege uh, to meet you once again. And on behalf of this group, uh, we are very, very grateful for the generosity of taking your precious time, and we are above all thrilled to be here with you. So I also would like to deeply thank you um, and also your chief of staff, right, um, Hasti, for her support, her kindness uh, throughout this process that uh, made this uh, session possible. Uh, we have agreed that I'm going to kick off this conversation with uh, four or five questions um, to Hubert. And then we are going to open for other questions from the members of our group, okay? So let's, let's go. Um, Hubert, uh, this is extraordinary transformation of Best Buy uh, based on the power of human connections and purpose was of course only possible because of your extraordinary journey of personal transformation. And in your book, you mentioned the metaphor of life shape it as two mountains to be climbed, right? So the first is the mountain of professional and financial success. And the second one is the mountain of meaning and purpose. And you reach at the top of your first mountain uh, quite early, right? So after um, a, a journey that included, you know, graduating from one of uh, uh, Francis Conicole, working at McKinsey, becoming a CEO in your early forties. So to an outside observer, you were already a role model and your life was, you know, the finest example of excellence and achievements. Almost, I would say, a dream uh, that would um, have come true for anyone. But what was missing? Why did you make this hard decision of climbing your second mountain and how did this happen? And of course, you're referring to uh, David Brooks' book, you know, the, the Second Mountain, a wonderful book. And I don't know that we necessarily need to climb the two mountains in sequence, but certainly at the top of that first mountain, I felt it was desolate. It was dry. There was no joy for me. There was no, and probably because there was no meaning. Uh, and maybe because to an extent, I, I probably felt I had been driven uh, too much by you know, the quest for power, power, fame, glory, or money. And uh, this is, of course, not something that's fulfilling. And so call this my midlife crisis. Uh, maybe that's not going to happen to anyone <laughs> on, the, on this call, but it happened to me. And so uh, I, what was healthy is that I actually took the time to step back. And I was very fortunate. I was invited by a former client of mine um, to um, go through the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, of course, the founder of the of the Jesuits, and there's many ways to, to, to you know, step back, but to, this was an opportunity to go through my life story, identify in my life the moments where there had been joy versus uh, not, and you know, through a lot of uh, spiritual reflection, discern my calling in life. Why, you know, why was I here? And earlier on in the early 90s, I had, uh, had the opportunity, I'd been invited by a couple of friends who were monks to uh, writes an article about the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work, right? Is work a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? Uh, is it something we do so that we can do something else? Like maybe uh, watch PSG lose to uh, Real Madrid earlier this week, uh, this, despite you know, a lot of talent? Or is it something that's part of our calling as human beings, part of our way to find fulfillment in our life. And of course, in most companies, vast majority of people, work is a necessary evil, right? Um, 
but we have a choice. We can decide why we work and how we can have work be part of our way to uh, do something good in the world. And so that was incredibly uh, transformative for me, uh, uh, Alexander. And it's, uh, you know, I think that a mistake I've made, I've made many mistakes in my life. One of the mistakes I made was that I thought that to be a good leader, you need to be, you need to be smart. And I need to be the smartest person in the room. One of the things I've learned over the years, and certainly during the pandemic, is that uh, as leaders, we need to lead with all of our body parts, right? Our, our head, but also our heart, our soul, our guts, our ears, our eyes, not just our brain. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, um, one of the most striking chapters, Hubert, of your book is titled, you know, The Problem with Perfection. And you mentioned that everyone around you, including yourself, uh, was expecting nothing but perfection from you. And in a certain sense, you delivered this, right, for a long time by always, you know, showing, as you said, that you were the smartest guy in the room, that you had all the answers, that everything was under control. But at the same time, uh, this quest for perfection has taken its toll, right? So particularly, uh, um, but as you mentioned, by preventing people around you from connecting with you in a deeper way. And you described that you then decided to embrace vulnerability and to allow yourself to show, let's say, um, your full self at work. So how did this process unfold? How difficult was it for you? And how rewarding was um, this change of attitude was uh, from both, you know, the personal and the professional standpoints? Thank you. Yeah, Alexander, because I was confusing perfection and performance, right? Of course, in business, we need to perform, right? There's, there's no doubt or in, the, in our activities as human beings. But the problem with perfection, if, if, um, if we're seeking to be perfect, well, here's the scoop. I was a human being, so I was not going to be perfect, right? And so therefore, I would not be able to accept myself as I was. Worse, I was not able to accept my team members, because here's this group, my team members were also human beings, therefore they were imperfect. Uh, and so that creates constant dissatisfaction um, and sort of almost depression, right? Whereas if we realize that, um, you know, we're not perfect, we're human beings. So we first, we can accept ourselves. We can love ourselves because to love others, you, start, you have to start with loving yourself. And then we can love others and accepting them with their imperfection. And that's really helpful to accept our imperfection because here's a very concrete example, right? Uh, Alexander, at the beginning of the pandemic, did you have, were you the one who had the manual to deal with COVID? Did you have that manual? No, of course <laughs> No, not. you did not, right? And probably nobody did. And so the only way to deal with COVID was to be able to say, I don't know. And we're going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to ask for advice and then try to figure out. And if, if this happens, then we can leverage our collective strengths and produce much better results because we're not limited you know, to uh, this uh, false idea of perfection. And then we can build these genuine human connections because the only way we can connect with each other at a very personal and deep and meaningful level is if we, we can open up if I can talk to you about my crucibles in life, then that, uh, that changes things. And because the only thing in, that's real in life is human connections in business, in life, that is what unleashes human magic, which is what we've seen at Best Buy. So uh, <laughs> now how did I recover from that disease? I got help, right? I couldn't do it myself. So uh, a transformative point in my life was uh, working with a coach. In 2009, my head of HR at Calson Companies walked into my office, Elizabeth Bastoni, and she said, would you like to work with a coach? And I said, Elizabeth, have I done something wrong? Right? Is there a problem? Has somebody complained? And she said, no, 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 this is a coach who helps successful leaders get better. And that's Marshall Goldsmith. He wrote this wonderful book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I highly recommend it. And he helped me discover not feedback, but feet forward. I always struggled with feedback because it's a bit depressing and you know what I cannot change the past, but feet forward, I can decide what I want to get better at and ask for help, right? Uh, you know, if I want to become a better delegator or better at unleashing growth, 
Maybe Alexander, I can ask you, do you have any advice for me? How do you do this you know, in your world? Or maybe anybody on this call can help me. So uh, really very, very powerful. Wow. Fantastic, fantastic, Ubea. Uh, in one of your interviews that I watched on the internet, you know, the host said that the thing he was mostly impressed about was that you really meant everything that you were saying. And, and this marked me a lot, you know, because um, uh, uh, there are a lot of, you know, nowadays um, CEOs, leaders talking about the importance of having a people-centric culture, of pursuing a higher purpose, but you actually implemented all of this and particularly as we are going to talk uh, um, ahead in a risky, in a very risky situation in which uh, it would be, let's say, easier to just follow the traditional um, recipe of, for running business. So my question is, how has been the reaction of your fellow uh, CEOs of large you know, Fortune 500 companies to your leadership philosophy? Do you think most of them are going to be, and the word is courageous enough, courageous enough to follow it? Uh, or on the other hand, are there leaders who see your leadership philosophy as a kind of a criticism or even a threat to their leadership styles? My sense, it, it'd be interesting to see people's uh, reaction on this call, is that the vast, vast majority of leaders today at all levels believe that you know, the old ways of leading are not working, right? It's the the uh, extreme focus on profit, the top-down, management approach, this is not working. And uh, the world needs companies that are a force for good and needs leaders who are purposeful and are able to you know, create an environment that, that can unleash that human magic. People are convinced, right? And for many decades, people have said, right? People is the most important thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So challenge, I don't think is convincing people intellectually. The challenge for all of us, self-included, is to learn how to lead in a different way. Because I would say personal experience, most of what I learned at business school in my early years as an executive, you know, was more the old model of you know, profit optimization and top-down uh, management uh, using incentives right, to drive behavior. And so we have to rewire ourselves. And that's why I wrote this book to, uh, to be a, a manual almost for leaders who are keen to move in that direction and need a bit of help. And frankly, I don't have the corner, the corner of wisdom on this, but I thought with my experience, I could offer the advice uh, and the very concrete examples. Um, and that's why I'm teaching at, at, at Harvard. That's why I'm coaching you know, CEOs in their journey. So I think we're all on a vast majority of us are on that journey. And we know from experience, it's not an easy one. We're, there's so much to learn. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions and then I'm going to open for um, all the members of this group. So please raise your hand um, when you want to make a, a, a question to, to, to Hubert. So uh, Hubert, please, um, you know, I'm moving now to the organizational change. Um, we're talking here about turnarounds, which are typically synonym of, as you say, cut, cut, cut. You know? And senior executives, basically, they carry out long meetings behind closed doors and then decide on costs and personal reductions, you know, everything based on spreadsheets. And you, of course, took a, a totally different route. And so uh, was there any pressure from, from the market to employ the traditional approach uh, to turn around uh, at Best Buy? And in particular, how important was, you know, listening to the frontline employees in your first days as CEOs, a CEO uh, for the decisions you made? How important was listening to the people at the front line? So thank you. So, so yes, rewind to uh, the summer of 2012. Um, I, I become the CEO of Best Buy and everybody thinks uh, we are gonna die, right? There was exactly zero buy recommendation on the stock. I think our market cap was like two times EBITDA or something like this, so not good. <laughs> Uh, and the key advice is, you're going to have to close stores. You're going to have to fire a lot of people. So we looked, closing stores, all of our stores were profitable. So what's the point of closing you know, profitable stores? Didn't make any sense. And firing a lot of people, it almost implied that people were the problem. I thought they were going to be the source of the, of the solution. And our diagnosis was that uh, you know, the, the, the problems we had were essentially self-inflicted uh, problems, you know, our prices were too high. Uh, uh, online shopping experience was bad. 
speed of shipping was bad. Um, the experience in the stores had deteriorated. Our cost structure was bloated. Um, so these are all self-inflicted problems, right? So that's good news, you can fix them. So uh, of course we could talk about the what we did and you know, it's, it's pretty commonsensical. Uh, the more interesting point is, is, is the how. It was a very human centric approach. Now every company on the planet says people, 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 what did we do? So the first thing I did to your point is my first week on the job, I spent it in a store, in a Best Buy store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, uh, just a hundred miles north of Minneapolis. I think they should say, they should say St. Cloud, right? Like in, around Paris, but for some reason this is St. Cloud, I couldn't convince them otherwise. And why did I go to that store? And, and by the way, oh, I still have this, I have it for you. I had this badge, CEO in training. Uh, <laughs> And I spent a week there with the associates, essentially asking them three questions, right? What's working? What's not working? What do you need? And my job was super easy. Take notes and then make sure we did something about it. So it was start with people, start with people at the top as well. You know, I'm a bit of a Maoist. Uh, I think fish rot from the head. If things are not going well, don't blame the frontliners, blame the top. And so we had to make some changes at the, at the top. So it starts with people. It's also ends with people. What do I mean by this? So in your turn, turnaround, in my turnaround manual, the first priority is always grow the revenue because it's amazing what revenue growth can do. Uh, it's not always intuitive because people feel cost reduction that's more certain than revenue growth. Yes, but you know, revenue growth is helpful. So make sure you focus on that. In parallel, go after the cost structure but first focus on non-salary expenses. So everything that has nothing to do with people, which at most companies is actually the vast majority of the cost structure. So as an example, Alexander, you know, at Best Buy, we, we sell a lot of TVs, right? They're large, they're thin, so they break. We would break for about $200 million, $200 million worth of TVs every year. And you know, working of course with the vendors, the supply chain, the stores, the customers, if you can reduce that by 50%, you know, it's good because we've checked 0% of customers want to buy a broken TV. You know? it's, it is, and so out of the $2 billion of cost we took out, more than two thirds were non-salary expenses like this. And every year, you know, we improve efficiencies along these lines. And if you are, if, if one plus two is not sufficient, you may have to cut headcount, but you do it as a last resort and maybe you redeploy because you have turnover. So there's ways to do this, and then it's all about creating energy. Uh, instead of, you know, oh no, this is all about being smart. No, 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 this is, okay. it's about creating energy. In physics, we learned that energy is a finite quantity. You cannot create it. In an organization, you can actually create energy. And our role as a leader is very much to create that energy. How do you create energy? You guys know this, right? Maybe you co-create the plan as opposed to telling others what to do. You get going, you start implementing. You celebrate the early wins. If something, if something is not working, maybe you, you and I worked on a project and it didn't work. So we just say it, we're transparent. Oh, this one didn't work out. We need, we're gonna need to rework this and then rinse and repeat. So this was our approach in the darkest days. So the focus on people is not just for when things are going well, that's easy. It actually is also when things are really grim. Wow. Fantastic, Hubert, thank you so much. And now my um, last question, my last minute of fame. <laughs> so um, after the initial years of turnaround uh, in which Best Buy was uh, no struggling for its survival, as you mentioned, uh, you decided that it was time to think about the longer term by formulating a, a higher purpose that would be the centerpiece, right, of the company's strategy, decisions, and behaviors. And in my view, uh, Uber, this was not a trivial decision because uh, there are many business leaders who prefer to maintain this sort of a permanent mindset of short-term short survival and scarcity and to avoid facing all deeper and actually more difficult issues related to the meaning uh, and the very concept of success. So could you please uh, share with us how this process of articulating Best Buy's uh, purpose took place, how it has been implemented um, so it made sense to everyone and how important 
um, was having this noble purpose for uh, for Best Buy to be where it is today. How much time do we have? <laughs> There's a lot to come <laughs> back. Right? So let me say a few things. So yes, after three or four years, you know, we had, uh, we could say that the turnaround was over, right? We had stabilized the company. We we're back on track, but we did we did want to define, you know, our future, and so we were doing some of the traditional work of you know, market, understand the market, segment the market, define your positioning, identify growth opportunities. But then we also wanted to focus on the why. Why do we exist in the world? And some of it, I'll come back to this, was from a business standpoint, but it actually started with us, the leadership team, started from within. Uh, and I think that's a key conviction I have is that personal purpose is a key foundation for corporate purpose. And so uh, one day, so every quarter we would get together as an executive team. You guys probably do this. You review the plans, you know, the changes, the opportunities, wh whatever is on the agenda. Uh, and so one day I had asked each of the executive team members to come to that offsite with a picture of themselves when they were little, so maybe two or three years old. We had some really cute pictures, believe me. And over dinner, we spent the evening sharing with each other our life story. So not our resume, right? We knew our resume, but our life story with the highs and the lows, the crucibles, the difficult moments, and our purpose in life. Okay? Now, we learned two things. One, everyone on the executive team was a human being. Quirky, beautiful, messy, you know, human being, not just a CFO or CMO or, you know, what have you. And two, with a couple of exceptions, maybe, all of us share the same kind of purpose in life, which is to do something good to other people, the golden rule. And then we step back and we said, look, we're the leadership team of Best Buy. Why don't we use this platform, which is Best Buy, to make a positive difference in the world and, and create an organization that employees are going to love, customers are going to love, vendors are going to love, communities are going to love, and of course, shareholders are going to love. And that changes everything, right? Because then work is not, so much, not, not just a job, it's part of our calling. And so that led us then to spend time on the corporate purpose, which uh, for me is at the intersection of uh, what the world needs, the, the human needs you're trying to address, what you're uniquely good at, what you're passionate about, and how you can make money. And we landed on saying we are, we're actually not a retailer. That's not a purpose being a retailer, right? We are a company that's there to enrich lives through technology. And we said by addressing key human needs of health, entertainment, communication, and so forth. And that's what's transformative because it's, of course, very inspiring. Also, it unlocks huge growth opportunities because you're no longer limited to your traditional way of, uh, of doing business. But then of course, you know, many companies uh, in the recent years have worked on defining their purpose in, in, in you know, we say raison d'etre in French, <laughs> their reason for being. Um, and then sometimes they rush to communicate it to everybody and cascade it down. And let's imagine, you know, you and I walk into a Best Buy store and we say, we have big news, we have a new corporate purpose. It's to enrich lives through technology. People you know, would look at us, I can guarantee that, and say, <laughs> oh, Alexander, anybody, we love you, but we have no idea what you just said. Right? It's completely corporate speech. So there's a ton of work that follows. You have to make, it, make that purpose the cornerstone of your strategy. So what are the specific manifestations of the strategy? So for us, it was a health strategy focused on aging seniors and how we could help them. Is a uh, in-home advisor program where we go to people's homes like a designer and to become your CIO, or CTO for your for your home. There is a, a new membership program where you know we're always going to be uh, here for you. So that's the strategy component. But then the most interesting piece, the hardest piece, is how do you enable everyone at the company to write themselves into that story, not by telling them about how wonderful that purpose is but by helping them connect what drives them, right, with their work and with the purpose of the company. And how do you reorient that? Uh, and then how do you create an environment at the company 
that's a very, in our case, a very human environment where you can actually unleash that human magic. And that may be, you know, where I've learned the most, and maybe we'll come back to this, but uh, in broad terms, that's a bit of summary of our journey, Alexander. Yes. And could you please, um, uh, Uber, uh, complement with this, this idea of implementation? Because uh, you carried out a series of workshops, right? And it was, for me, it was really, uh, it had a lot of impact because I saw the concreteness of how can you um, go from just you no know, this articulation, this beautiful articulation, but to the daily lives of everyone. And then I'm going to be to be quiet and, and hand over to Angela because uh, <laughs> I talked a lot already. <laughs> so so to, to to your point, um, you know, I, I give credit to our team. They, they they managed to distill down this idea of enriching lives through technology by saying what we're trying to be for our customers is an inspiring friend. And what they did is, uh, so one day, one Saturday morning in June of 2017, we closed down all of the stores for a few hours before you know, opening, because we like the revenue on Saturdays in retail. Uh, and no PowerPoint, no video from the CEO, nothing like this. We were uh, put in small groups of three or four. And we were asked to do two things. One, share with each other your life story. And two, share with each other the story of an inspiring friend in your life. Okay. I was paired with uh, a young woman. She had been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She had been homeless. And Best Buy was her, was her home, was her family. Was, of course, all of a sudden I see her not as an employee, but as a human being with all of this complexity, right? She was going through. And then the inspiring friend, so for me, it's my older brother, Philip, he's a wonderful guy. I think you should have invited him instead of me, it's much better. Uh, and, and hopefully everybody on this call has an inspiring friend in their life and is an inspiring friend to somebody. And then what we said is, look, uh, what we're trying to do, which we already do when we are at our best, is to try to treat each other and the customers as human beings and try to treat each other and our customers, not as walking wallets, but as an inspiring friend to them. And of course, everybody gets that, right? Because this is real life. And immediately people get what it means. Now, of course, uh, we've all gone to trainings where you, know, you go back and you're in a poisonous environment. So, Training was not sufficient. Then you had to do the work of creating that environment. And in the book, I, I talk about the, the five ingredients that uh, can be used to unleash human magic because here's the scoop, right? The traditional approach of, uh, you know, you, you create new jobs, you, you uh, align incentives, right? And you hope that something good happens. Well, if you, if you use carrots and sticks, right? You get donkeys. And in an organization, you don't want donkeys, right? Because motivation is intrinsic. And so you have to create an environment where people can find meaning in their, in their jobs. So I had a um, store general manager in Boston. He would ask everyone in the store to uh, this question, what is your dream, right? At Best Buy, outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Okay, write it down in the break room, my job, is to help you achieve your dream. So that's a very practical thing you can do, right? Sit down with your team, do the kind of dinner I did with my executive team, ask them what is their dream, right? Uh, it's about human connections, being vulnerable, and that's role modeling for us as leaders is really important, making sure that everybody feels they belong. I'm telling you things you already know, right? Creating autonomy because none of us like to be told what to do. So you have to create enough space for people to give their unique, bring their unique genius to their to their job as opposed to prescribing everything. Create a learning environment where everyone can learn and grow. And what we've learned, it's, it's one employee at a time, right? Because let's imagine for a second, uh, Alexander, that uh, Roger Federer and I have a coach, the same coach. It's not true, but let's imagine for a second, we have the same coach. I can't guarantee you, the coach is not gonna uh, 
uh, you know, uh, do the same things with Roger and with me, right? And so it's the same for our employees. It's what are the unique needs, coaching needs that are in each employee uh, needs. And then it's creating a growth environment. And then it's from a leadership standpoint, it's, it's adopting new ways of leading away from the leader as the superhero who knows everything um, and can fix everything to the leader as a, an authentic human leader who is clear about their purpose and curious about the purpose of people around them, who is uh, vulnerable, authentic, uh, uh, humble, empathetic, and is there to create the right environment for others to be successful. So it's a, it's a fascinating journey, but uh, it's so rewarding, right? Because then you, you see 125,000 people becoming the best version of themselves and doing magical things for each other and, and for customers. Wow. Oh, I'm feeling small here. You know, it's uh, coming from a CEO. Oh, my God, what have I done to you? No, in the sense that, uh, you know, it's... Um, so all just, of us. Yes, yes, it's incredible. I'm going to hand over to, to, to Angela. Uh, please, Angela. Thank you, Zoli, for being here. Thank you so much. Merci uh, beaucoup. Um, uh, especially, I'm grateful uh, for you to put the words... Um, magic, connection, values, meaning, love in the corporate dictionary <laughs> because it's, uh, it's so rare for us to see uh, business leaders to speaking freely about it and not being ashamed. Um, and thank you also for being this, uh, the person that can say, well, we have to connect our bodies, our souls, our minds, and, and et cetera. And um, my question for you is um, on collective intelligence and um, how to build on this through diversity and inclusion. Because mm. here, at least in Brazil, we have a lot of lip lipstick service, right? Mm. And uh, words are very cheap and uh, um, I'm not seeing, of course, the, um, uh, the, 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 the path that I wanted to see regarding the, the diversity and inclusion um, to be implemented, really. People want just uh, um, a training, a workshop, and don't want to change the process that they hire. They don't change the process that they, um, uh, the, the co-working, the co-construction of, of uh, process and everything. So I wanted to know about uh, what was your uh, approach on this subject? Um, and also, how can we change investors' view? Because they want, they still want the superhero. They don't want a vulnerable person that says, well, I'm imperfect. I need others to be with me, to construct with me. So how can we change this, um, this story for them to, to know, well, we really need the, the, the strong of it in the richness of everyone here? So I'll start actually with the second part of your question, which is the investors. Don't assume. I would, let's, let me rephrase it. I would not assume that investors have certain expectations, right? Uh, I think investors are human beings and they're doing their job. You know, they're in the US certainly to take care of our retirement, uh, but they're smart. And so in my experience, they understand that uh, to create great results, it takes an army. Of course, they talk to the CEO and, and the CFO because that's the, and the uh, investor relation people and so forth. But, they understand. So I, I think sometimes a mistake we make in life is we assume others expect something of us and therefore we do it. I think it's much better to be clear about our convictions and then share them with uh, others. And so with our public investors, you know, initially they didn't, we had zero credibility, but you know, we worked hard to build the credibility and we, we did what we think was the right thing. And we never did something that uh, we would have regretted. Uh, and the share price went from $11 to uh, around 
more than hundred dollars now. So even after the the, the recent uh, correction, you know, um, on diversity. So I think it starts with a uh, with a, a business conviction, which is that uh, diverse teams perform better than non-diverse teams. Uh, and there's a ton of research. McKinsey has done a ton of research. Christine Lagarde, the uh, uh, head of the ECB and former head of uh, the International Monetary Fund, has famously said that if it had been Lehman Brothers and sisters, as opposed to Lehman Brothers, it would not have been the same outcome. And it's diversity from a way of thinking, from a background, but also from a gender and ethnic uh, standpoint. And so, you know, how crazy would it be to just recruit from a quarter of the population, the people who look like me? Well, that'd be stupid, right? Because we don't have the corner on talent. Uh, and so it makes such a, so you have to start with this and it's, it's uh, gender, uh, certainly in the US, uh, it's all of these other uh, dimensions, right? Uh, uh, ethnicity and, and, and uh, color and, and, and so forth. And, and it's very, very simple. And I remember sitting down with Melody Hobson, the president of AO Investment, she's now chair of Starbucks, uh, amazing African-American woman. She said, Hubert, do you know that uh, the soap dispensers in the bathrooms in hotels do a terrible job with black hands? And if you're a black person with very dark skin, you're not going to be able to get soap. I said, well, I had no idea, Melody, what, this is crazy. Right? Well, because infrared technology does not do a good job of detecting red. If you don't have anybody black on your team, you're not going to know. Everybody in the black community knows. Same with uh, cameras for smartphones. You know, for a long time, they did a terrible job taking pictures of black uh, individuals. And so, uh, you know, you're going to miss. Uh, or in certain parts of Chicago, if in our stores, we don't have Polish speakers, you know, we're not going to sell much. Or in Orlando, when we had a lot of Brazilian tourists coming to Orlando, Florida, if you if your blue shirt didn't speak Portuguese, <laughs> you know, not very helpful. Uh, and so it makes incredible business sense. And I think you have to realize it with your head and also, of course, your heart, right? And feel and personally understand the pain of our Black African American colleagues or of these young women who are denied. Uh, opportunities. And I think that once you realize this, you know, in the corporate world, we know how to deal with and to solve business problems, right? If, if it's a matter of going after a particular segment of the market, we know how to do this. So, but then we have to do the work in the same way as relates to diversity and understand why are we not able to attract, promote, retain, develop, you know, great talent from different groups. You know, if I'm not in the US, I'm not able to recruit great talent. Oh, I was not recruiting from the HBCUs, the historically black, black college and colleges and universities. Of course, I've, I'm not fishing in the right ponds, uh, or you know uh, any of these uh, of these things. And then, as leaders, we need to you know uh, move the needle. I know that, for example, when I left uh, the board of Best Buy in 2020, we had a majority of women on our board, and we had three black uh, African American directors. And for the, the recruiting of black directors, what we told Heidrich and Struggle, the, the search firm we're using, is said, don't bother uh, showing us resumes of uh, non-black candidates. You know, <laughs> don't bother. Um, oh, and by the way, if you believe you're not able to show us great resumes of black candidates, we'll accept that. Completely understandable, we'll accept that. Except we'll work with another firm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And they, of course, they showed us amazing uh, candidates and recruited them. And it made a big difference because the thing I've learned is that uh, you cannot be who you cannot see. Right? And as Melody Hobson shared that with me. So if you're a black employee and everybody at the top is white, you're gonna say, this is not a place for me. And so it made a huge difference to get, you know, get our act together. So uh, this is in the just do it category. <laughs> And, and thank you. Fantastic. And and uh, before Yeda, can we take a collective photo to register this moment, please? <laughs> so yes. the other ones can open the camera. Appreciate. Thank you. And so Angela, are you going to take yes. it? Yes. One, two, three. Go. Oh. 
uh, wait because some there are some people that opening their cameras. One, two, three. Let me take a look. Okay, go ahead, Nida, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hubert. It's very inspiring. Everybody is glued on the screen uh, with your uh, pearls of our wisdom. I just want to ask you two quick questions. Nowadays, CEOs of big, large corporations, they um, have to travel a lot. They have multiple uh, commitments. They don't have time. And uh, frequently, a lot of CEOs, they keep themselves in an ivory tower, surrounded by people that are very similar to them. And uh, these people take control of the CEO agenda. Uh, so I would like to ask you to uh, provide uh, other ideas on how do you make time to listen to people when you're in such a large and multinational organizations. So you start going to the shops, but uh, how continuous a CEO should do this to um, assure that they listen to real people. And the second one, uh, you have uh, your leadership team and you are not uh, the only one you have to inspire others to do things that are similar, that are inspiration as well. So how do you build up a, a remuneration reward package that inspire good behavior? Oh, I see, yes. Uh, so on this, the, the first one, time management. So at, at Harvard, we, we do a, a program for new CEOs. In fact, if you uh, know uh, new CEOs of, uh, of large companies, you know, send them my way. It's, it's a great program that we do with uh, Michael Porter started it and uh, Bill George, Nitin Noya, and I've become a member of that faculty. And one of the things that uh, Michael Porter and Nitin have done is study how CEOs spend their time. And in a sense, that, that's their unique resource, right? Uh, <laughs> because they don't have more time than anybody else. And so Deciding how to spend your time is really important. So I'm sure you guys do this, right? So being clear about your priorities, and then you decide, you essentially decide how you're going to spend your time. So I set goals for myself explicitly. So when I was in a B2B business, when I was the CEO of uh, Carlson Vagondi Travel, or the, the president of EDS France, I would make sure I would speak with or meet with at least five clients or industry partners like SAP and Oracle per week. So being on the front line of the business because that's what, how you learn. At Best Buy, I made sure that uh, every week I would visit a store, uh, most of the time unannounced. Uh, I would also make sure that I would, uh, uh, that gave me this giant excuse to buy a lot of consumer electronics products. <laughs> because I would go personally through the process of buying either online or in stores and then accessing the service. So instead of asking my admin, ah, the TV is not working, get somebody to fix this, right? It's unacceptable. No, no, no. I would call the 1-800 number, you know? Oh, I've been waiting for 60 minutes. This is not good, you know? And then, because that's how you experience, uh, you know, this thing. And, and uh, I think it's part of the, you're absolutely right, Yada, if you, it's dangerous. So I had no chief of staff, for example. I refused to have a chief of staff, right? And uh, uh, doing skip level meetings. If, if there's a problem, you, you actually you know, do focus groups on the areas where you're responsible. You don't want to mess up and you know, do the job of other people. But these are some of the, of the things. But it's a constant discipline uh, to, to follow as relates to remuneration. So I am. Um, um, on the comp committee at both Johnson & Johnson and Ralph Lauren. And, and of course, for my life, I've spent a lot of time designing compensation system, right? <laughs> uh, here's what I know. One, financial incentives uh, do a terrible job of driving performance. In fact, they deteriorate performance. In the old days, in, you know, during uh, a century ago, under the, the time of Taylor, when work was quite mechanical, financial incentives could actually drive superior performance. But there's research now with, from MIT that shows that for complex jobs where creativity is important, financial incentives actually deteriorate performance because it narrows the mind. In fact, you could ask yourself this morning when you got up, did you decide the, 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 the way you were gonna organize your day was gonna be based on how to maximize your bonus at the end of the year? 
you know, raise your hand if you, <laughs> nobody does this. So why should we assume that incentives are gonna drive behaviors? Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that rewards, that rewards are important. We should share the wealth, right? And then the design of the incentives can help communicate what's important, right? Uh, but let's not expect too much because the other thing, you know, right from your, I don't know your experience, but my experience is that you can never get this right. You know, you try, you know, to get something that's perfect, that's going to be completely aligned with what you want to accomplish. And in fact, in his book, Reed Hastings, of course, who is this, the founder of Netflix, tells a story where they designed incentive for their new head of marketing. And after the first meeting, he realized that it was the wrong goals that they had set, so you, know, uh, so you have to say, okay, it's, we need to have one. It allows to share wealth, but let's not use that as the key driver of performance. Wow. These are shocking news to at least some people here. <laughs> but of course, um, that, um, these are things that we have been um, also talking about. Uh, because it's, of course, it's backed by science and we can see that, uh, right? So, uh, Sergio, please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thanks for your inspiring story, inspiring words, Hubert. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, to, to be very specific on, on one situation that I believe companies are still facing. And we have some cultures in some organization that there is a misunderstanding, in my opinion, between human connection, building human connection, as you mentioned, and the, the pitch, I'm not here to make friends oh. in the whole organization, for the good and the bad, uh, but usually to avoid these human connections, usually. And we have some, some, some organizations with that culture yet. In my opinion, it's a personal opinion, and, and of course there are many ways to do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole change management process to be done in that situation. But I'd like to hear from you, from your experience, uh, did you face those kind of situations? Uh, what was your approach? What, did you, what have you seen around this specific dilemma and, and how to deal with that on top of uh, of something that I'm mentioning, like a whole change management process. Yeah, thank you for your question, Sergio. The, the, what I, you know, I can share some opinions like you. I don't have you know, the, the corner of wisdom. I, I have some opinions. Um, I agree, you, you don't necessarily need to, uh, to be friends with everybody or to, uh, to treat everybody as friends. And sometimes people say it's dangerous actually to uh, equate business with a family because in a family, you know, by the way, there's some dysfunctional families, but in a family, you know, people are a member of the family forever, whereas in business, not everybody is going to be here forever. So there's a limit to this. But uh, in, in The Godfather, you may remember that scene where Tessio talks to Tom Hagen and says, uh, tell Michael I actually liked him. It was only business, nothing personal. <laughs> so we're celebrating actually the 50th anniversary of Godfather this week. Um, and I think business is indeed personal um, and, and it's, you know, you need to build, I mean, because you're going to spend a lot of time and I think you, you, it's going to be more enriching, fulfilling and performing if, if there is this humanity in the, in the business for sure. I, I, I know that the alternative is very grim where everybody is just doing their thing and then not paying attention. That's very um, different. The reality then is that uh, of course, there's times where you know you may have to uh, ask a senior leader to go because they're not carrying their weight or their behaviors are not in line with the values of the company. But that doesn't make them an enemy or somebody to. I mean, it can still be human, um, you know, the the and treat them with humanity. Uh, and because you know we're not gods, right? We're not there to say, oh my God, this is a bad person or a good person. No. My judgment, I've made a decision, you know, you should move on and, you know, we're gonna to try to do this as well as possible. So I think that uh, that's how I'm thinking about it. So it's a bit nuanced, uh, but I think that's, you know, the, the, certainly the resurgence of Best Buy was largely explained by these human connections in this humanity, in this heart. And, you know, I love this um, 
poem from uh, uh, the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, right? Who said, uh, you know, work is love made visible. So I think there's absolutely love in business. In fact, the best brands, you know, you call them love brands, where customers love them. And of course, it starts with the employees loving working at the company and then loving the customers. Uh, so that's how I think about it. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Mara, please go ahead. Hello. Thank you, Hubbard. Thank you for being here with us this morning. And thank you for the book. I think for me, it was very uh, easy to read the kind of language and the descriptions and all the examples. So fascinating. Uh, my question uh, has to do with, uh, uh, if I can quote uh, a little passage of the book, it's when you say that uh, letting go of the outcome is not easy. And you give us the, the metaphor of the, the ten, tennis uh, gaming. If you focus too much on winning the point, you, you, you might uh, not win it and you should uh, more, more um, the best way would be for you to focus and focus on the ball and not in the end uh, in the end result. Um, I've recently turned 50 and uh, I feel like uh, I'm starting to worry more about processes and people and a little bit less about the ending result. But at the same time, um, it gives us, sometimes it gives us people an idea of lacking of energy, lacking of commitment, or you, people sometimes understand that if you're not, if you don't have, in, in Portuguese, we say blood on your eyes, if you're not there for the final result, then you're not committed, or maybe you're too old for the task. Uh, so that's, that, that's the point that, uh, resonates to me and the point I am at my life now. So that would be my question for you. How can we focus on the process and the people and the love, uh, but at the same time be, be uh, aware and, and try to be transparent with what you are and who you are, but send a message that uh, you, you, you care for the end result as, as well. You're making such a good point, Mara, right? The fact that uh, you're focused on behaviors and process and people doesn't mean you don't care, right? There's two independent dimensions. In fact, the theme of one of our, every, every year we would get the, the store general managers together ahead of the holiday season. And several years, the theme was all in. Right? You can be all in and being really driven, but uh, uh, focus also on, on, on people and process. Let me give you an example, a very concrete illustration, because yes, it takes time to, to really grasp this. So think about a frontline manager and a frontline manager would be only focused on results. And I, you know, I remember early in my career, there was a boss who told me, appreciate effort, but the only thing I care about is results. And it sounded great at the time, but he was wrong. And so let's imagine a manager you know, their communication with their team, you know, they uh, applaud if the results are good, if they uh, yell and scream if the results are not good. This adds no value. You know, the, 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 the team members are not stupid. They can see the results. So having the manager tell them the result adds no value. One of the mm -hmm. things we've learned that was a game changer for us in our frontline performance was, uh, and it started in the Denver market, um, is Chris Schmidt, who was the manager for that market, created a program of individualized coaching of the sales associates. And every week, every associate would sit down with their manager, their supervisor. They would look at the results and look at the drivers of the results, and then they would look together at what was, you know, what was driving the results, the behaviors. So for example, let's imagine I'm working in the appliance department and my sales are below you know, the standards and what other colleagues are achieving. My supervisor and I look at it and say, oh, that's because the average unit per transaction is lower than what others are doing. And uh, so then we do a role play. You know, I come into the store, I'm looking to buy a washing machine, right? And uh, you know, the 
salesperson asked me, you know, why do you want to change it? Well, you know, it was an old machine. It was 12 years old, so it broke. Um, great, we can help you with that. Oh, by the way, do you also have a matching dryer? They're in the US, we have these big houses. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I, I do. And I bought it at the same time, it's a pair. To what extent is it important to you that your washing machine and your dryer match, right? From a style and color standpoint. Well, it, it is, you know, because of course I like my laundry room to be neat. Well, chances are that, you know, in one or two years, your dryer is also gonna, you know, end its life, right? Because they, these things are not eternal. So we have a promotion if you buy a washing machine and a dryer at the same time, you know, there's a bundle and I have a good deal for you. Would that be of interest to you? And that, so the supervisor through this role play has helped me, you know, build new behaviors and skills. And that leads to a better outcome. And so uh, both of us were all in, but we focus on behaviors rather than just yelling and screaming. This is so important that because here in Brazil, it's been popular for many companies to, um, to put as a core value, focus on results as one of its core, core values. And it, the intentions are, are good, but it's very dangerous. And I've been criticizing this over the years because it's, it sends very dangerous messages and sometimes demotivating messages. So uh, Professor Carvalhosa, please. Uh, uh, Professor Hubert, uh, we learned that you are, you have the honorable position of a professor of the Business School of Harvard University. So my question is very short. What is the reaction of the students uh, uh, taking in consideration your, uh, your ideas about business, about enterprises, about relationships with, between the people in, in, the, in, the, in the enterprise. What is the reaction of this new generation about all these marvelous ideas you, you uh, I, I believe you uh, every day or every opportunity show and, and teach for these people? Uh, thank you for your question, Professor. And I love it when you call me Professor. It makes me feel really important now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I've not done a, an exhaustive survey, uh, but my impression is that uh, these ideas, um, you know, are in the heart of most people. And in fact, you know, we, we said they're new. Actually, they're not new, right? They go back. You know, they, they're there in all of the monotheist faith. They're all there in all of the, you know, East Asian or South Asian uh, spiritualities, this desire to do something good. Uh, and, and so it's always been there. I think we've, the problem is that we've had a 30 or 50 year hiatus in business following Milton Friedman. Uh, and of course now everybody's realizing that uh, it's not working. And I also have, you know, children who are in their late twenties and early thirties and this myth that uh, you know economic development is you know and financial performance is the be all and it all they don't believe in it uh, and the the it's not hard right because even I who is the eternal optimist you know during the pandemic uh, like many I stepped down and I said we have to say it out loud the world we live in is not working right we have of course a health crisis but also economic crisis societal issues big time racial issues, an environmental time bomb, geopolitical tensions, we know this. It's not working, we have to say it. And what's the definition of madness, according to Einstein? Do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. And so there's this desire to do something else. And I think in particular, this notion of business being a force for good, you, you've all seen, I think, I'm sure the uh, study by Edelman on the fact that uh, businesses are the most trusted of all organizations. And certainly the company you work at uh, are very trusted because they people feel that they can be a need to be a force for goods. They can contribute to solving societal issues. There is a declaration of interdependence that we're all feeling uh, that, uh, you know, Best Buy is headquartered in Minneapolis. 
And following the murder of George Floyd, you know, if the city is on fire, well, it's simple. You cannot open the stores. Or to quote uh, Rebecca Anderson uh, at Harvard, you know, if the, if the planet is on fire, that's the biggest business risk we have. So um, the answers may not be easy, but uh, certainly this Refoundation of business around purpose and humanity, I think, is a shared, is a widely shared view. Part of the reason why I went to uh, I've endowed a chair at HEC Paris on purposeful leadership and, and I'm teaching there is that business education needs to shift, right? Because it's too focused on techniques and not focused enough on these ideas. So I think we're at the beginning, it feels to me, Professor, that we're at the beginning of this journey. There's a great desire to move in a different direction. And we're all gonna be on this learning journey and this leadership journey to try to invent and create a future that does not exist yet, but that needs to be better than what we have now. And I think that this next generation, they, they have expectations uh, of, their, of the companies, the companies they're gonna be working at, they want to work at a purposeful company, a company where they're gonna be treated as human beings. It's, that's my sense, I don't know whether, you guys share that perspective. I'm sure you all have children, uh, uh, or maybe you are millennials yourself. I, you know, it's hard to tell on, on, on Zoom. It's great, this refoundation of business, a great um, um, quote. Um, Hubert, um, yeah. just for time management purposes, do you have a hard stop right now at nine o'clock, or do we have five, 10 um, minutes that just to, to make a conclusion? Just to, please feel comfortable. We're only grateful for you. No, I, we can go. We can go a little bit over. Of course, pleasure. Okay, thank you so much for your extra generosity. <laughs> uh, Andy, please. So, Professor, thank you for for being here with us, and thank you for the book. It's been great, and uh, it uh, connected with my own career that many times. Um, and when you touch the point of diversity and um, African American community, it obviously and for those reasons touched me. And when we listen to Mara, uh, I have a question that the context is very, very little companies, uh, in my point of view, are driving to that point of a more humanistic view on how to deal with people in the company and the world itself. And there are many others, uh, smaller companies, medium companies um, with uh, family owned companies that they are not caring much about that at this point in time. And as a diverse person in the, in the, the middle management or a director of a company that um, has been fighting on the market that looks like more a bloodshed <laughs> on the day to day. Um, how not to fall into the trap of perfection, as you mentioned on, on your book, um, and still have a chance to climb up and get to the top and, and, and apply all this view of a more humanistic uh, uh, approach to the business. So I think another way to ask your question is how do we, how can we grow as leaders and how can we be on a journey to continuously you know, get better leaders and learn new, take the risk to learn new skills and new behaviors without, you know, losing our ability to uh, deliver great results. Um, one, of the, one of the things I believe uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, I've certainly benefited greatly from working with a coach. And it's very interesting in, in sports, so I've done a very extensive uh, study, uh, exactly 100% of the top 100 tennis players in the world have a coach, right? <laughs> and, and it's not just on the way to being number one, right? Roger Federer still has a coach or, 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 or you know, Rafa and, and so forth. And uh, it's interesting that for some reasons in business, we believe we're much better than anybody else. And we, we, for, for a long time, having a coach was limited to uh, the remedial situation. So, Jack or Mary are working with a coach. But what's wrong with them? Do they have a problem? No, they're trying to get better, you know? It's, and so I think that I'm seeing a trend certainly in the US where more and more uh, leaders and executives work with a coach because it's hard to operate on oneself. So now it can be a coach, it can be a spiritual director, it can be a loving partner, it can be your, 
you know, uh, your own discipline around meditation, um, yoga. You know, there's a variety of ways you can do this. Um, but I think everybody's journey is this. It's, it's learning to get better because if we, if we stop growing, that's when we got in trouble. Uh, and so, yes, competition is stiff, right? I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I've said for one nanosecond that, uh, you know, winning at Best Buy was easy, right? Business is, customers are demanding, employees are demanding, you know, financial markets are demanding. It's hard and it's getting increasingly sophisticated with all of these stakeholders who want us to do all of these things. So there's no doubt that we continuously need to get better. And I think the wisdom here, Andy, is to say, you know, my name is Hubert and I need help because what I'm expected to do is new, hard, different. I wanna get better at these things and I'm gonna need help. Maybe you come and visit with us at uh, Harvard. We have some wonderful programs. Uh, or you get a coach or you, you ask a colleague, ask for advice. My, my name, so maybe everybody should raise their right hand and say, so everybody, can, you, can you please everybody raise your right hand? Okay. So you're going to repeat after me, right? My name is Alexander or Hubert. My name is Angela. <laughs> okay. My name is Alex. <laughs> My name and is I Angela. Help. I need <laughs> help. And I need help. <laughs> I need help. I really need. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> I definitely need help. You know, thanks for your, your, your answer. Thanks for being here with us. And, and Hubert, uh, I, like, I have just one last question because I, I had to make to you, I've been dreaming for, for some time to making this uh, question uh, to you because this is um, um, uh, a curiosity that I have. I am reading a, a, a book, which is Maslow on Management. It's a classic book, it's about 60 years old. And it's very interesting because it's no quite very up to date. And th there is a, a, a passage here that I would like to, you know, to, to, to hear from you, your views, because he says basically that the whole development of enlightened leadership depends on bosses being able to give up, uh, to give up power over other people, permitting them to be free, and in fact, enjoying the freedom of other people and the self-actualization of other people. So he says that the person best suited to be the leader is the psychologically healthier human being who take pleasure in the growth of other people. And on the other hand, he says that obsessional neurotics have a compulsive need for control, for prediction, for a structure, for law and order, for an agenda, for planning. It, it is as if, as if these people were afraid of the fear and also mistrusted their abilities to improvise in the face of an emergency. So these are all fear and anxiety mechanisms. So my question is, do you agree with this diagnosis? Do you believe that good leadership is to a large extent a natural outcome of our psychological health? I do. <laughs> and in fact, you know, maybe the most important decision we make as leaders is who do we put in positions of power? And as we do this, certainly a mistake I, I made for many years was to put too much emphasis or you know, exclusively on, on experience and expertise. And increasingly, I've put emphasis on who is this person? What kind of a leader is she gonna be? Um, you know, and, and, and that's how you, uh, you get these great uh, results. And, the last thing I would say, Alexander, is um, you know during the during the COVID pandemic, if we couldn't go outside, you know we had to go inside. And spending time with yourself as a leader and trying to define what kind of a leader you want to be, how you want to be remembered. You know, my uh, uh, beautiful wife uh, Hortense, who's an executive coach, uh, ask her. She asked her clients to write down their eulogy you know, what people are gonna say on that day where you're not here to listen. Uh, and I think that, so picking the right leaders because there's so, so little we can do as leaders. So everything gets done through others. So taking leaders uh, who have these qualities that you're describing is so, uh, is, is so critical. And, and, and by the way, in the category of needing help. So um, my name is Hubert and I need help. The, the book at some point, I don't have the, yet the pub date, 
is going to be translated into Portuguese for the Brazilian market. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, I may get back to you all and ask for your help in launching the book in Brazil, right? Because it's it's hard work to launch and, and promote. So um, I may be back to you with, uh, you know, uh, asking for advice or support on how to best launch the Brazilian translation of the book in, uh, in your beautiful country. So my name is Hubert, I need help. It would be our pleasure, our honor. Congratulations, a round of applause. It's, it's been a, it's a memorable mm -hmm. occasion. Je voudrais vous remercier beaucoup encore une fois d'être ici avec nous. C'était une occasion vraiment, uh, vraiment mémorable. Uh, so thank you, Beth, once again, on behalf of the group. It's been quite a memorable occasion for all of us. And hopefully not a once in a lifetime occasion. Hopefully we <laughs> would like to see you in the future. So thank you once thank again. You. And thank, thank you, you everyone so much, for being Robert. here as well. Thank you. We'll, thank you. we'll join you in, during the launch event. So please Portuguese. count on please us. Count on us. Yeah. Count on us. <laughs> thank you bye so bye. much. It was a treat. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, you. Bye thank so you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, wow. All right, Alexander, I'm going to run, but so good speaking yes. with you. That wow. was a treat. Thank, Thank you. Treat for us too. It's Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are very grateful for having you here. And with that, tres son pachicos, sí, tres son pachicos, tres son pachicos. Merci. That's inspiring. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci. Merci. Merci.